Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I live in Ottawa, and uh, last Friday, Friday, September 21st, sort of late afternoon, we experienced a, a uh, massive storm system. A cold front came through the region. That cold air drove up warm, humid air. That hot air that was rising caused the water vapor content within to condense out, releasing large amounts of energy, which fueled the power of the storm. And the jet streams were basically guiding this storm as well. And what happened is there was a supercell basically that came sweeping across. This is a very large collection. A supercell is a very large collection of thunderstorms with um, rotation in the center. This came across and it spawned a bunch of tornadoes, the largest being um, an EF3, which started which um, started forming or basically touched down west of Ottawa, came across, um, jumped across the river and went into Gatineau on the Quebec side. And there was a second storm, an EF2, which touched down in South Ottawa and moved across Ottawa. There was a third storm, a third tornado identified out near Calabogie, and also in this same storm, all happening within the, about the same time period, there were three tornadoes reported, all EF1s, I believe, up in Quebec. So we had six tornadoes up here in the Ottawa region. We're at 45 degrees north latitude. So I wanna talk about you know, questions that everybody's sort of asking, are we getting, is this something that is going to become more normal in Ottawa? Is this like a freak event? Um, basically, you need the ingredient of hot, humid air rising and that water in the air condenses. You need a clash with cold air. In this case, it was the cold front that came through and you need um, the jet streams in some form. Um, to uh, generally initiate the rotation. Although tornado genesis, what causes the actual rotation of the funnel, there's still a lot of science lacking on that. If you've been paying attention to my videos and elsewhere, you'll know that the Arctic is darker because we're losing sea ice and snow cover. Underneath the sea ice, there's dark ocean. Underneath the snow cover on land, there's dark permafrost. So the Arctic is getting darker. It's absorbing more solar radiation. It's heating up, it's getting warmer. It's warming much faster than the rest of the planet. Um, this reduces the temperature difference or gradient to the equator. So the jet streams slow down and become much wavier. So we're getting an increase in the frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events. For every one degree Celsius warming, there's 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere. Tornadoes, as we've just experienced in Ottawa, are extremely unusual, as I'll go into in this video. Um, and getting them this late in the air is even more unusual. But we've had a very, very warm September with hot, humid days, temperatures reaching from 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, extremely high humidity a continuation of the uh, summer heat waves, basically. So in a nutshell, climate change has its signature all over these, uh, this outbreak of tornadoes that we've seen um, just last week in, in Ottawa. I'd like to point out a couple of things that are different. Um, you know, when we think of Tornado Alley, you know, Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, parts of Nebraska, we know there's loads of tornadoes that form in Tornado Alley. Um, the conditions um, are favorable for forming them. But with the jet streams shifting, in fact, with the jet streams um, shifting with abrupt climate change, rapid climate change, it's very possible that we will start experiencing fewer tornadoes in places like Tornado Alley and more and more tornadoes um, as we go northward from Tornado Alley, you know, up into Canada. So 
there's also a big difference. You know, in Tornado Alley, we have basically the plains. We have grass and dirt. A big tornado forms. You get this funnel cloud. You can't actually see the rotating air, but what you can see is the, the tornado, you know, touches down. It sucks up grass and dirt and small particles into the funnel, and then the funnel becomes highly defined, highly visible for miles away. Now, up here um, in Ottawa, we basically, we don't have grass plains, lots of dust and dirt available. We get a fair amount of rainfall. So we do have forests, lots of forests. And these, um, there's, there's also, um, you know, hills and valleys and things, river, you know, rivers and stuff. And so the behavior of the tornado, there's not a, not a, as much small debris for the tornado to pick up. There's not as much grass and dirt for it to pick up. So what we're seeing, the, what these tornadoes we're experiencing here, how they're different is often the funnel, you can't really see the funnel. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that a bit, but there's a video shooting towards Parliament Hill in downtown Ottawa with the Gatineau Hills in Quebec in the background and you can see all the storm activity moving west to east, and you can see small funnel-like features dropping down from the clouds. Um, and then it's clear. You can't really see anything down to the ground, but then on the ground you can see swirling and dust and so on. So I believe that was one of the tornadoes captured, but the funnel is not distinct because there's not an easy source of very small debris that can go up. It's more of trees and branches and things. Um, and so these tornadoes can be much, can appear to be much more, much different. So another thing is, is the classification of the category um, or class of tornado. Um, it used to be the F scale, Fujita scale, so F1, F2, F3, a much newer scale that was adopted first in the US, I think about 2004 or something. It took till about 2013 to be adopted in Canada. It's the enhanced Fujita scale, the EF scale. So an EF3, um, which we experienced um, in, in one of the tornadoes that came across Ottawa, winds are up to 265 kilometers an hour. Um, that's the high end uh, EF3, almost EF4. Um, now, in the U.S., these categories are determined fairly quickly, the, the, the size by um, the, the U.S. Meteorological, uh, the National Weather Service, etc., from radars. Um, the, the, in Canada, they're not classified until after the fact. Um, a, group, a team from Environment Canada goes out and they assess the damages. Um, they assess the damages on the ground and then from that they can determine the maximum wind speed and from that they determine the class of, of uh, tornado uh, based on that, what they get from on the, on the ground measurements after the event. So teams went out Saturday morning and they got this data, although they only identified tornado, the Calabogie tornado in EF1 from satellite images because there's thing, something called the downburst and, and that they thought the initial tornado damage in South Ottawa was a downburst, but from on the ground measurements, you can see a, a swath, a path, and you can, uh, from the damage within the swath, you can get the class of tornado. Another thing is that the US, um, the, the radar systems in the US are the next rad radar systems and they're much better than Canada's radar system. Not only are they higher resolution, but there's way, way more features um, that can be accessed um, on the radar. For example, hydrometeorology showing you hail, uh, much many, many more options on total rainfall amounts, etc. Uh, so when I was tracking this storm on Friday night on my iPhone with the, with the app called Radar Scope, and I'll talk about that more, um, I used the US radar as opposed to the local Canadian radar because it ex the US radar extended enough, enough up to past Ottawa where I could capture these storms. So we definitely need to upgrade these older radar stations in Canada. Another point I'd like to make is the, you know, we talk about the class of a tornado. What's, 
we really go by it depends on damage and that depends on the wind speed over the ground so we call it the ground speed so this storm the ef3 this whole frontal storm system cold front that came barreling by had massive speed it was very very fast you know i've seen numbers 60 to 80 kilometers an hour speed of the whole storm front moving across so you have your rotation speed and this tornado is being dragged very very quickly by the uh, whole frontal system at 80 kilometers an hour up to 80 kilometers an hour speed so consider this suppose we have the rotation speed of a tornado being let's say a kilometer diameter the rotation speed is 150 kilometers an hour okay now this tornado is um, it's low pressure in the center the pressure is down to you know 0.4 of an atmosphere 400 millibar even so uh, say a one kilometer tornado the suction in the eye if you like of the tornado the center low pressure area is enormous it's going to be sucking up lots of things if it goes over buildings for example the buildings can actually the pressure can actually force the buildings apart even and then the debris will be carried up by the tornado but the wind when you, if it's rotating counterclockwise, as most tornadoes are, low pressure in the center, air comes in, deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere, the thing is rotating counterclockwise, um, that's reverse for you, um, then the right front quadrant from the tornado's perspective will have the rotation speed plus the translation speed. So it would be 150 plus 80 in my example, or 230 kilometers an hour. And that would bring you up to an EF3 tornado. So what I'm saying is if a tornado was hardly moving and it was EF1 winds, 150 kilometers, now move at 80 kilometers in the right front quadrant, it's going 230, which is a, which is a category EF3, according to damage that would be measured on the ground or maximum wind speed over the surface. In the left front quadrant, you have 150 the rotation minus the 80. It would only be 70, 70 kilometer an hour wind in the left front quadrant from the tornado's perspective. So if you, in other words, um, the damage within the actual kilometer swath of the tornado is hugely different depending on what quadrant you are. The right front quadrant being the most damage, assuming the thing is, is rotating counterclockwise. If it's rotating clockwise, it's the opposite. So that's the first key point. The second key point is if the diameter of the tornado is one kilometer and it's moving 80 kilometers an hour, that one kilometer um, low pressure area or tornado, basically the tornado, will pass over a given area in 1 80th of an hour. 1 80th of an hour would be three quarters of a minute or 45 seconds. So when the tornado is moving this fast, 80 kilometers an hour translation speed, it's only over an area for a very, for a fraction of a minute. Okay, if it's half a kilometer diameter, it'd be 20, 25 seconds. If it's a kilometer diameter, 45 seconds at that speed. And this obviously is not enough time to completely shred everything in its path. So if you're in the right front quadrant is where you get those maximum winds. They vary within the eye, you get the pressure drop so, so what you basically see is you see some things are untouched and other things are completely destroyed um, in these types of winds. So the very, very fast storm, it, it, you could argue that it meant the tornado was over a certain region for a very limited length of time, which would r reduce the damage to a minimum. But then when you add that very fast forward speed to the tornado, it makes the damage in the right front quadrant enormous, huge okay, uh, up to the EF3 um, amount. Um, I mentioned the rugged terrain here, okay? Um, it's not the grasslands of Kansas, it's not flat, it doesn't have a lot of dust and things that can be picked up. So not only does it make the tornado, um, sometimes it makes the tornado very difficult to see, you can't even see it. And also there are some heavy rain bands with this EF3 and that also hides the tornado. I went and I surveyed the damage with my meteorologist friend Martin on driving around on Monday, surveying the damage. And towards Dunrobin, there's a there's a ridge of, of trees, um, and that was 